Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Impact Farming Show. Today, we have an amazing guest. We have Sarah Fallon Tate joining us. Sarah, how are you? I am great. How are you? Good. I'm so excited for this episode. I've followed you online and your work for some time. So I'm incredibly excited to bring this episode to our audience about property ownership, property rights, and conservation. So before we dive in, Sarah, you are the owner of Wild West Advocacy, and you have an amazing story, deep roots in advocacy and deep roots in ranching. Can you tell our audience a little bit about who you are and what you do? Absolutely. So again, my name is Sarah Fallon Tate. I am a sixth generation Wyoming ranch kid. That ranching is really what my extended family does, my immediately family, my immediate family does, uh, something that we hold very, very dear to our hearts. Um, and I am also a third generation advocate. Um, my grandfathers on both sides were very interested in policy and really got involved and they would go back to DC and talk about important issues. One of them being from Nevada, the other one being from Wyoming, talking about important issues that impact ranching. Then both of my parents um, growing up in those environments went to law school and became attorneys and they defend farmers and ranchers and their private property rights in land disputes, water disputes. Um, they are constantly in suits against the federal government, uh, really working to maintain private property rights. And then I went to law school as well. However, instead of going down the attorney route, I started using my law degree for advocacy, really trying to educate people about the laws that impact farming and ranching and all kinds of conservation issues, um, trying to both educate farmers and ranchers and and also the general public, um, trying to teach them about what agriculture is, why we do what we do, how it's beneficial for the environment, um, and really just a, a whole circle of um, legal agriculture types of issues. Most recently, I started teaching at the University of Wyoming. I teach the undergraduate level agriculture law class. So it's been a really fun experience to get to talk to college students about a lot of these legal issues that I find to be very, very important, primarily for students who want to go back into production agriculture. Oh, I love it. And I follow you on TikTok, LinkedIn, I think maybe some of the other platforms too, and I've followed your work lately, and I can tell how passionate you are. So I'm going to ask you a two-part question, and I think the one really leads to your answer for the other one. Do you feel like land ownership and property rights are under attack? And I guess that goes hand in hand in why you're so passionate about this work. So what are your thoughts on that? I absolutely do think that land and property rights are being attacked. I think that they've been being attacked for a long time by the government. I also think that a lot of times there are groups who attack property rights and agriculture organizations not necessarily because they hate agriculture or hate what we do, but because there is a huge, huge, huge misconception about agriculture and the environment. We hear all the time that, you know, especially being in the cattle industry, we hear all the time that, you know, cattle are destroying the environment. And while that is absolutely not true, that is still the narrative that we have to change. And so I think that the government has all governments really work on gaining more and more control. And I think that that certainly has been happening in the United States, especially in the last several decades. But I think that that misconception is what drives other organizations into attacking us as well. Mm, I love it. I know that's a big thing in the States. We've seen some encroachments on property rights a little bit in Canada, but I'd say for the most part, compared to the States, and if you look at a lot of the stuff that's going on in Europe with the Dutch farmers, mm -hmm. all of that stuff, they've had some big property rights issues out there. Canada, not as much, but I do feel it's important. And I know you have so much information. So I'm excited to talk to you about Really, to me, this episode and my goal is to go, okay, as farmers, our land is our farm. 
whether you are a cattle farmer or a grain farmer, without land and the right and freedom to use it how we want to use it, we don't have a farm. So I know there's a few things out there that are important and farmers may or may not be aware of them. So we have a super episode for you guys today talking about probably about four or five things and picking Sarah's brain on each of the areas and what farmers should be concerned about. So let's start with energy companies, pipelines, all of that kind of stuff. We're going to lump that in a big category. Do you want to speak to that and how that has been encroaching in different areas, different ways? Sure. So, you know, the thing with energy is obviously similar to agriculture, totally necessary to our society. Um, you know, we need pipelines to get oil across um, the various countries. We get a lot of oil from Canada, pipelines that go across our, our borders. That's really important. Transmission lines, getting electricity um, across uh, the country is all very, very important. Most people in our society today would not know how to function without energy and electricity. Um, however, I think that it's really important to talk about landowners' rights. So when you have a power line or a pipeline, that's crossing somebody's private property. And when those types of projects cross private property, you have that private property owner has a whole bunch of new concerns attached to their property from what happens if the pipeline breaks or leaks and damages their soil? What happens if there is a fire on uh, from a transmission line, from a power line? What, what happens then? And so what we have seen is initially when power lines and pipelines started becoming a um, major construction across our country, um, our government was allowing eminent domain. Now, eminent domain is a concept that basically allows the government, um, or in these cases now, allows a power company to essentially take property, um, an easement of property for just compensation. So now in the context of a pipeline that is usually, you know, right above ground, you know, where the pipeline exists in a certain amount of space on either side, the, the property owner does get compensated. They get whatever is just basic uh, land value at that time, whatever the land can be assessed at for agriculture value at that time, um, regardless of if the landowner wants the project or not. Um, so initially when the government started allowing um, pipeline companies or transmission lines or whoever to invoke eminent domain, which initially was only for the government, it was so that you wouldn't have like, you know, 500 miles worth of pipeline all set up and ready to go. And then you have, you know, one landowner somewhere in the middle who has, you know, a quarter mile of the pipeline, who's just being unreasonable, won't budge, won't take any money, just says absolutely not. So the power of eminent domain was really for those unreasonable landowners. It was never meant to be able to use to be used as a stick to force miles and miles, hundreds of miles of landowners into forcibly taking on these projects. Because again, there's just a lot of problems that come with the projects. Yeah. Okay, good. That's an excellent explanation. I've been watching a few things going on in the States. Somebody I'm following down there. I'm like, how does this all work? I was curious. I don't deal with this. Fortunately, I haven't had any lines come through our property or any, any of those kind of concerns. So I'm glad you addressed that. Okay. If you don't have anything else to add, I know we could probably do a whole episode about that. And then probably an episode for each state. Cause I imagine there is little details and nuances for each situation. If you don't have anything to add about the energy companies, I want to move on to conservation programs and get you to explain a little bit about some of the programs out there and farmers that enroll their acres in and what they may know or may not know about what can happen with their land because of that enrollment into these programs. 
Yeah, there's a lot of different types of um, conservation programs. And the thing about them is if you are considering enrolling your land in a conservation easement or a land trust or anything like that, that isn't necessarily a bad thing, but you need to make sure you understand what your rights are and what the duration is of that program. So for example, in the States, we have a program called CRP. It's the Conservation Reserve Program which basically allows farmers or ranchers to take a certain amount of acreage of their property, they sign a contract with the federal government, they get paid by the federal government, and then they do not farm those acres for a certain amount of time, usually 10 years. So you don't use that acreage, it's being um, conserved by the government's um, definition of conservation. And if there is an emergency with the rest of your farm, you know, you get you get droughted out or um, you have some kind of a major problem that doesn't allow you to farm the rest of your property, you can still uh, talk to the government and a lot of times you can get that acreage back out and use it so that you don't go out of business. Okay. There are other types of conservation programs like a lot of conservation easements that there is no duration. So you sign your land up for this program and it's like that forever. Uh, so if you want to change the use of your land or you do decide you want to um, you know, develop it or something like that, you no longer have those rights to be able to do so. So it's really, really important to understand exactly what program you're entering into, um, what rights are being revoked. Some conservation easements don't allow like cattle grazing or they don't allow um, you know, certain, you know, farming aspects. So you need to make sure you know what rights you're giving up and how long you're giving those rights up for. And those are all individual contracts. So it's a contract by contract basis. Okay, fantastic. So CRP, I had done a episode with Margaret Byfield about the 30 by 30 land grab, and we had chatted just briefly about the conservation program and the other part that I want to clarify with you um, I guess there's probably the umbrella of conservation I don't know what you call that and then there's easements what is a land trust how is what is that and how is that different than a program like CRP or an easement forgive the ignorance here I'm I know just enough to be dangerous Sarah that's why I'm excited to have you on <laughs> So I look at land trusts almost like like an HOA um, that you would have in a you know housing development. Okay. Um, so you can put your land into a land trust, and then you have to abide by the land trust rules. So for example, in Wyoming, um, the stock growers, which is a really great um, agriculture organization, has a land trust that you can put your land into. And in that trust, while it's in that trust, um, you can only do certain things. So the, the land trust that the stock growers has is specifically to preserve agriculture land. So you can still do your ranching on it, you can still do your farming, but you're not allowed to develop that land. Um, like other trusts, you can take your land out of the trust. Um, and so when you put your land in a trust, you're basically agreeing that yourself and all the other landowners who have their land in this trust are going to abide by the same rules. Okay. I, okay, forgive me. I'm a big private property person and I'm not a fan necessarily of putting my property into those types of programs, just personal preference. A lot of people do, and there's some good income. Why would you put your property in a land trust. It, what are the benefits? Do they get paid on that? You... Um, I'm honestly not totally sure if they get paid in the okay. Wyoming land trust, but it does ensure that if, you know, some, you know, big company shows up and says, I'm going to subdivide on this part of the land, or, you know, they say that, you know, we're expanding this city and it's going to come onto your land and they're trying to buy your land as per the land trust, which is a contract, um, they won't be able to do that on that property. So okay. it's like, I think a lot of people put their land in this Wyoming land trust so that it can stay agriculture ranching land. Okay. Okay. I get it now. 
I, I'm not really familiar with that concept. And I think it's probably a little bit different. It's different in the States than it is up here in Canada, but I, we have a lot of US viewers and I wanted to cover that. It's maybe one more question. I'm curious if you know, to me, a trust is always something that's wrapped around a will up here. When I hear trust, you would put something in a trust for your children. Is that what people would do? Put land into a trust for their children or that's just totally separate from wills and it's more just to protect the agriculture land sure so i mean it is it is totally related so you put your land in a trust so that um your children will have it as agricultural land oh, or okay. whoever whoever you decide to bequest that land to so it is still it's it's protecting it for future generations is the idea Okay, I got it. Sorry, I was a little bit slow on that one. So if I am mom Tracy or grandma Tracy, and I'm about to pass away, I have my will done, and I don't want it being sold off, and I want it saved for my, my children and grandchildren, you would put it into a land trust to make sure that it's continued to be farmed instead of sold off and developed. That could be one angle, right? Yes. Yep. And so okay. then when you put it in the trust, there are certain types of trusts that are revocable and some that are not. Okay. And so um, if you put your, tr your land in a irrevocable trust, then the things that are allowed to be done on that land, um, are, like perpetually will still be done on that land. It protects, it protects that land in as long as it is in the trust. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Okay, so conservation programs, easement, land trust. Is there anything else that you wanted to add there? We could do a whole <laughs> episode just on that too. There's a there's an awful lot there, so we ought to move on so we can get through the rest of our okay, topics. <laughs> perfect. So I heard you speaking on another podcast about the Endangered Species Act. And the fact that the government was changing it in ways that might be a little bit dangerous, if I recall correctly, it, maybe I'm putting words in your mouth. Do you want to touch on how that's being changed and how that can affect farmers? Sure. So in the United States, um, in our government setup, our Congress passes our laws and then Congress always writes laws, as my mom would say, so that you can drive a Mack truck straight through them. They're extremely, extremely broad, which makes them hard to enforce. So then our president and his agencies are the ones tasked with enforcing the laws. So Congress has given them the ability to write regulations. And these regulations are like the smaller rules that help with enforcement of Congress's laws. And the problem with that is every time we get a new president every four or eight years, um, those regulations change. So you look at just that, you know, from in the United States, um, the policies that President Obama would have to the policies that President Trump would have to the policies that President Biden would have. And those are huge, huge swings in politics and policy. And so the regulations change dramatically, um, you know, since, since the Obama administration, absolutely, but really it happens in every presidential administration anyway. Okay. So when it comes to the Endangered Species Act, things like how species are listed or how they're delisted or how critical habitat works, all of those are things that change in every presidential administration. So under the, I believe um, what I was probably talking about um, on the other podcast that you were listening to was under the Trump administration, those regulations were written so that you know the same criteria to list the species um, was the same as the criteria to delist the species. Under the Biden administration, you have these criteria to list the species, but the ones to delist the species are not the same. So you have all of these reasons that a species is being listed. If you fix all of those reasons, that doesn't necessarily mean that the species is going to be delisted. Um, which can be a problem because that means that I, I, somewhere around like 2% of species in the United States have ever been recovered. Um, and so when species are um, protected and then critical habitat is designated, critical habitat designation basically shuts down use of that land. 
Um, and so it can be a big problem because it's very hard to put use back on the land after a species has been designated there. Okay. I want to go two ways really quick and maybe spin off this or share your thoughts. One up here, we actually had a very extreme example happen in the area we live in and quite quite I think Margaret was even surprised when I was talking about it we have land and I actually owned land 640 acres right behind like close in the area there was a crocus or an orchid I can't remember the flower it is a protected species endangered species here in Manitoba and because this flower was found on some land in the town where I'm located, Vita, Manitoba. The Amish people that had moved from Ontario, they moved here to farm this land, bought this land, and there was an endangered species of flower. All of a sudden, people found the flower in the ditch, went onto the Amish land, found it on their land, told the government, and then it ended up that the government said, you're going to get a $50,000 fine if you continue to farm. The Amish brought their lawyer, bought it. They didn't win, actually. The flower ruled the day. They couldn't farm that land. They ended up packing up and going to Wisconsin. But here, right in Manitoba, that's that's what happened with a flower. These farmers couldn't farm because of a flower. So, yeah, go ahead. So I am actually not surprised at all about that. Um, in the United States, um, our courts have basically decided that endangered species protection trumps absolutely everything. So there's a case, um, I, I believe it's um, PBA versus Hill is what it's called. And that was a case where there was a, the Teleco Dam was being built, which was a huge dam, um, which was going to supply power. It was, you know, it, a reservoir was built, um, all kinds of things. It was going to help the economy and it was going to help with flood prevention of the homes in this area. And I believe it was the snail darter, which is a fish, was found and the court just decided that protection of the snail darter and taking down the dam was more important than flood prevention of these homes. Um, and there's been many examples of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of projects, you know, one project, a couple hundred thousand dollars will be stopped because of one endangered species that may or may not be able to be saved and may or may not have the same exact ecological function as another species. So another example is in Wyoming, the Prevost Meadow Jumping Mouse was listed and designated on a ranch here close by um, the ranch that I live on. And it is a jumping mouse that is almost biologically completely the same as other jumping mice. Um, the only way to tell the difference between the Prevost Meadow jumping mouse and all the other jumping mice is by killing it and taking a biopsy. Yet, the government was willing to shut down um, branches, multi-generation branches, and stop use of riparian lands around where I live to save a mouse that you literally can only tell the difference if you kill it and take a biopsy of it. Um, That's and <laughs> It's, it's totally insane. You know, nobody wants any species to go extinct, but when it's a subspecies of a subspecies of a subspecies and it's not going to damage, you know, you can just breed it back into existence. There's no reason to be shutting down agriculture and livelihoods and other industries. Yeah. I'm a farmer. I'll say it, Frank. It's my show. I'm pretty sure we don't care about that mouse. Yeah. I say it? As farmers, <laughs> they're rodents. I mean, they... Yeah. They're pests, right? That's unbelievable. You know, and that's what's scary to me. And I wanted to ask you one more thing on this. It looks like there's a move to by the government to take back land and protect it. Won't go too deep into that. I mean, I chatted with Margaret about the 30 by 30 land grab. If anybody wants to look at that, they can look at that episode. But to me here's where my brain goes and I'm jumping here, but 
we heard about those wolves being released in what state? It was last year sometime. Do you... It was in Colorado. Mm-hmm. Okay. My neighbor state. Okay. So here's my question. And maybe we need to put a legal disclaimer here that there's no legal advice being given. And this is just me <laughs> talking out loud. Okay. But here's where I am concerned. So they release that wolf. It was an endangered species, right? Is that the, Do you know? As far as the gray wolf goes, that's a really, really complicated endangered species that's been listed and delisted and listed oh, a okay. whole bunch of times. So um, it it is protected in Colorado. Okay. Not okay. in necessarily all states. Okay. So my question, and let's not go deep because there's so many nuances, like you said, state by state, area by area species. But here's the thing. If what I'm concerned about as a property owner, let's say they release a species and it ends up on your land. It's a protected species. Is there any all of a sudden implications where you're a cattle farmer and you want to put your cows out to that pasture and there's a wolf den? Is this happen? Like, is this illogical that I'm jumping to these conclusions? No, and that actually has happened. Um, so in Colorado, they were released, you know, very recently. So there hasn't been um, too many horror stories yet. Right. Yeah. Um, I will say that, so um, Colorado is a state um, directly south of Wyoming where I live. And one of the wolves that was released in Colorado came up to Wyoming and it was shot within like two days oh. or something crazy. So it's, you know, the laws are very different from state to state. Okay. Um, we, we don't really want them no. up here. Um, but an example like what you're talking about happened in New Mexico. So the Mexican wolf, which is a smaller, um, you know, breed of the gray wolf was released on the New Mexico, Arizona border. And it was released, you know, several decades ago now. And there were only a few pairs that were released, but now the issue is that they can breed with coyotes and they can breed with dogs. And so you have all these like crazy hybrid animals that you can't really tell what they are from a distance. And they are absolutely eating people out of house and home. Um, I have some clients that I've worked with on some media projects from New Mexico, and they'll say that on some years, they'll have 50% of their calf crop eaten. Um, And there were stories, horror stories, literally. And I went to these houses. I saw these places, you know, they had like little play sets and things like that for their kids in their backyard. They built like a cage around the play set that they could put their kids in when they were small because the poor the, the wolves will literally like get up on their porches and like will walk between you know uh, this area is very very remote so a lot of these kids are homeschooled and they'll have like separate buildings to go to school in and they'll see the wolves like in between their house and like their schoolhouse um and stories of like you know the the kid horse that is in a pen 100 yards from the house being killed by wolves mm-hmm. um I, we could have a whole episode just on wolf horror stories in New Mexico. Um, wow. And that is what I am afraid is going to happen in Colorado is it already happened in New Mexico and there's nothing you can do about it unless you actively are watching the wolf attack your livestock or threaten your family, you legally cannot do anything about it. Um, and so then it's almost impossible. There are programs to compensate ranchers for livestock loss due to wolf kills. But the problem is, you know, so they're out there in the middle of nowhere, um, the really the very, very middle of nowhere. And so you have livestock that's been, you know, obviously killed by a wolf. It's all like they, they start from the hind end. And so you can tell when it's a wolf that has killed the livestock. And then you have to call someone from the government to come and look at the livestock. You can't move it. You just have to leave it there. And by the time that this livestock agent comes out, you know, or the Fish and Wildlife Service or APHIS or whoever, we've got a whole, we've got a whole ton of federal agencies in the United States. Um, by the time they come and look at this cow, you've had, you know, all kinds of critters and hawks and all kinds of things eaten, eaten on the carcass. And so then they're like, well, you know, it could have been that a wolf was eating on this cow, but you don't know for sure that that's what killed it. So we're not going to compensate you. Crazy. 
it's totally crazy. And seeing the turmoil that these folks in New Mexico are already in, I am totally afraid that that's exactly what's going to happen in Colorado now. Wow. I was watching that too. And whether it's the U.S., Canada, or anywhere, I think as farmers, there's that delicate balance, right? As farmers, we love the land. We love animals. But on the other hand, we're aware of the land and we're aware of wildlife where the 98% of the population that doesn't farm, they're like, oh, return the wolves to the wildlife. Like, it's so beautiful, right? And it sounds beautiful, but they don't actually have the boots on the ground and they're the voting power. They're the majority and the farmers are left dealing with the consequences. And to me, getting ahead of this and talking about it because that directly affects our land rights what if that wolf shows up on your land and it's protected and there's a den and well i mean and that's also secondary from the calf kill and the animal damage right there's that and then to me i'm also concerned about oh the wolf's on your land what happens to your ability to farm it and i mean there's so many different angles and rights and states that's really one of the big reasons i wanted to chat with you about this um a lot of the endangered species and how they're working to protect stuff and the rationale there and also their desire to control more land for various reasons and that intersection right and how that's going to affect farmers the more and more that we proceed with this that was a long-winded statement. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I mean, you're you're absolutely right. I totally agree with you. As far as wolves go, um, really the main thing, like here, wolves are mostly being turned out in, in ranch country. And so they say you're still allowed to ranch, but you're not allowed to harm, harass, take, kill, or attempt to do any of those things. Um, if you have an endangered species on your property, you're allowed to haze it away and, you know, the difference between what hazing is and harassing is, I could not tell you what the difference is. But you're allowed to do one, not allowed to do the other, or you're looking at $50,000 fine and up to five years in federal prison. Wow. That's crazy, eh? So you see a wolf, and we won't get in the nitty gritty, I'll just make a statement. You see a wolf, you take your quad or your horse, and you go out and try and shoo it off. Is that harassed? Crazy, crazy. Wow. I know we could probably talk. <laughs> You're right. We could probably speak about this in detail, each one of those points for an hour each episode each. So that's great. I'm glad that you covered that because the Colorado wolf thing, that was big in the headlines too. And not always do the farmer's perspective get heard or talked about, right? So that's why I wanted to chat here. I would say the farmer's and ranchers perspective almost never gets heard mm. when it comes to those kinds of issues. Um, again, because again, like you said, the voting center is in the cities where these people don't have to deal with it. You know, Denver is the biggest city in Colorado. And so we've been saying, you know, if you want them so bad, let's turn them loose in the middle of Denver and, mm -hmm. you know, see how long you want to keep them because they cause a lot of problems. And, and with that said, I want to make it clear that I don't want wolves to go extinct, right? Like I don't want any species to go extinct, totally. but if we're going to be turning these out on people's private property, we need to allow these people to protect themselves, protect their families, um, protect their pets. Dogs are killed by wolves all the time, mm. all the time. And you can't tell the difference between ones that are protected and ones that are and one that's a weird hybrid coyote thing. You know, you can't, you can't tell the difference. And so if these people want to release these species so badly, they need to be thinking about the farmers and the ranchers and the people who have to deal with them every day and figure out how to help those farmers work with the wildlife, not just shove the farmer and the rancher down and say, sorry, you know, we, we have to figure out how to make them coexist and saying, I'm sorry, just deal with it. Maybe we'll give you some money. Maybe we won't. That's, that's not a relationship. That's a dictatorship. Ooh, well said. Okay. If you don't have anything to add to endangered species, we'll leave it on that note. That was perfect. One other area, one last point I wanted to chat about to wrap it up. I heard you speaking about natural asset companies and there was some stuff going on. Do you want to hit that high level? Because I don't even know how 
how many people heard about that or even understand the reader's notes on that. So do you just want to touch on that a little bit? Yeah, that was, um, that was crazy. So luckily we did get that stopped for now. Um, but what that was is the SEC, the security exchange company, or um, uh, I'm sorry, um, SEC, um, they're the federal agency that oversees the um, New York Stock Exchange. Right. Okay. Um, and so they came up with regulations, which again are the rules that um, change from presidential administration to presidential administration. And they basically said that they were going to allow either private property owners or government entities, including foreign governments, um, to take land in the United States. Um, they can either lease federal lands, which was the most disturbing part to me that we could that we would allow foreign government entities to lease federal lands and control our natural resources. Yeah. Um, and put them in a natural asset company. And in this natural asset company, you weren't allowed to do hardly anything with the land. You could do renewable energy because everybody likes to pretend that renewable energy doesn't have an impact on the environment. I'm not anti-renewable energy, but we need to be really honest about what it is and what it does to the environment. Yes. Um, you could do regenerative agriculture, which again, I'm not anti-regenerative agriculture, but it doesn't work everywhere. Um, you know, for example, one of the, things I've been told about like regenerative ranching is that you're not supposed to have to feed hay. Well, I live in Wyoming and we have to feed hay like seven months of the year because it snows a lot. Um, and so, you know, regenerative agriculture and renewable energy just doesn't work everywhere. So then you put these, um, these lands that you can do very restricted things with in a natural asset company and those assets are tradable on the New York Stock Exchange. And, you know, I, personally have an issue with taking land out of production. Anyway, I don't think that's how we conserve land. I don't think that that's how we're going to save the environment. It's certainly not how we're going to deal with like food and energy security. Um, but we were going to allow, you know, foreign governments to say what can be done with the land in the United States, which I think is just an unbelievably dangerous thing to do. Um, to try to say this quickly without getting too in depth about it, um, we have federal laws. Um, a lot of the West, the Western states is owned by the federal government. And then it's leased by private individuals for ranching or energy production or whatever. And those lands are supposed to be used for what they call multiple use. So it's used for recreation, farming, ranching, energy, all of the above. And multiple times, um, organizations have come and tried to make it so that conservation or non-use, no use at all, is a use of these federal lands. And time and time again, our courts have said that non-use cannot be a use of the land. You can't just lease the land and then do nothing with it. Mm. Um, and so this was another way to try to stop use of our federal land so that somebody with a whole ton of money, which let's face it, that's not farmers and ranchers, that's you know, giant corporations or, you know, foreign governments is that that part really sent me over the edge. Um, they're going to be they would be able to purchase the leases of these lands and then not let us get our own resources. Um, so luckily, the SEC got in thousands and thousands and thousands of comments on this rule when it was being proposed, and then they withdrew the rule at least for now. Um, there's not very many people who think that it's going to stay withdrawn. We think that we're going to have to fight that battle again coming up. But it's just another example of how the government is working to stop use of our land, stop agriculture, stop energy production in the name of saving the environment. Mm. And that's where that misconception comes in, that people think that removing use from the land saves the environment, and it doesn't. Okay. Okay. Question for you. Why mm -hmm. would, I don't understand, maybe this is going too deep. Why would these foreign companies want the land? Are they going to mine it? Just take it out of production? So, I don't yeah, get I it. I mean, they, they can't mine it. Um, you know, they can only do um, renewable energy, so wind or solar or regenerative agriculture. And I think the big worry is they would take it and put it into non-use 
if we can't use our lands because it's all tied up in natural asset companies, that's going to force us to have to import more food, import more energy. Okay. And, you know, as I firmly believe that we should be both food and energy secure, you know, importing to some extent, exporting, but we have enough resources that, you know, we, we should be able to take care of ourselves. But that's going to be a way to force us to rely on other countries, which I'm just really uncomfortable with because they – Say we're getting all of our oil from, you know, Syria or for somewhere in the Middle East. Um, and then there's a war similar, you know, Ukraine or what's happening in Israel. And that cuts off our supply. We're in big trouble. Um, I think it's really important for every country to, you know, obviously we have to import and export and, and maintain those international um, relationships. But it's also really important to be able to sustain yourself if you know there's world war three or something like that yeah okay i'm just trying to piece it together like why what is the why <laughs> and i mean there might be several reasons but one actually if i'm piecing together what margaret said with the 30 by 30 agenda i don't want to put words in your mouth so we can go there or not but is that that might actually go hand in hand with that they want to take if we believe that and they've said that they want to take 30 percent of the land and put it back to natural habitat this these natural asset companies would be one way that they're accomplishing that is that the yeah absolutely theory behind it okay oh okay. yeah i think so and i think that large companies and large corporations everybody wants to be known as being like a green company you know we save the environment and so i think that they would want to obtain these lands so that then they can go talk to their consumers you know we're we're green we're buying this land and we're saving it um all the while putting it in natural asset company tradable on the new york stock exchange so making money out of not using the land so and, that they can just turn around and say i'm a green company uh, okay i get it and these lands would be currently farmed by farmers they're going to lose that land we won't be able to produce food and then the conservation movement wins farmers are at a loss and negatively affected food security is negatively affected did i get it Yes. Yeah, pretty much. There's a lot of like other regulations and laws yeah. that kind of tie into that, but um, it gets, it gets really complicated, but that's a pretty good summary of generally okay. what could happen. Okay. I'm just kind of, I'm going like, okay, whose goal here? Who's going to be affected? Trying to piece it together for our audience, because you know what? We're all busy. They're farmers. There's so much out there. And on the flip side, a lot of this can be hidden and they might not even know about what's going on. Right. I don't even think a lot of people have heard about um, 30 by 30 or the NACs, natural asset companies. Okay, I have one more question that has bugged me a little bit. And let's not go deep if we don't want to, need to, have to. When we put land into the CRP program, and here <laughs> you're probably like, Tracy, I'm a lawyer. I don't like these ifs and these scenarios. So if we can't <laughs> go there, we don't go there. But one of the things, like my goal here is to say, hey, farmers, here's these programs. Here's what's going on there might be a plan to try and remove some of our land from us in different ways. So my question with the CRP program, and I've been wondering about this, if you put your land into those programs versus holding it privately, no government money, no government program, do you threaten the security of your land for reasons like such as endangered species like are you jeopardizing your land and your ownership rights by having land in these conservation programs does that make sense is that a safe question to ask that's a big one so are you saying if you put your land in the crp are you at a higher risk of yeah. being designated as critical habitat yeah um that's a really hard question okay um so the fish and wildlife service is supposed to use the best science available totally unbiased um when they are choosing lands that are going to be designated as critical habitat um i personally don't actually think that they do that but that's what they're supposed to be doing so you will never get anybody to admit or any evidence ever that proves that if you have your land in crp that you're more likely to be designated as critical habitat 
But I think if you think about it, um, you have this land that's been untouched for several years. You've got an endangered species living there. It's going to be easier to regulate that land, and they're probably going to deem it like healthier habitat. So um, I think that when you're not using the land, that puts you at maybe a higher risk of having it designated as critical habitat. Um, but that's just because of the non-use. So if it wasn't in CRP and you were just on your own conserving the land, it would probably result in the same thing. Okay. Um, you know, I don't think that it's specifically because it's CRP, but because of the current uses on that land. Okay. Okay. Thanks for answering that. I, I have a curious mind and I'm always careful as I think we should be, right? What are we doing with our land? What are we what programs are we putting on it? Because, well, heck, we need to farm our land to be able to farm. So I'm always curious. And my mind kind of jumped a little bit there to see if maybe there was a threat to land ownership and usage in those kind of cases. So, you know, that was one a thing. Sure. Uh, sorry. Um, the one thing I would say about CRP or any of those programs, if you are considering putting your land in one of those programs, it's really important. To, and again, this isn't legal advice, but just kind of general, my own perspective about it. But I would really think about what potential future uses do I want of this land? Someday, is my kid going to want to build a house? Someday, am I going to want to build a feedlot? You know, I think that it's really, really important to consider what you want to do with that land in the future. Because if you're only looking at these programs based on what you do with the land right now, it could possibly cut off those future uses that you may or may not want to do in the future. And it just takes away your choice yes. to do that with that land. So it's it's really important to consider what you would want to do with it in the future. That's lovely. And that was my next question. And kind of the basis for this episode, seeing as what happened right in our area, that is pretty extreme. And Sarah, to be honest, like I told you, we had land right behind there. They could have probably started walking. And the weirdest part is the government here quite some time ago gave anybody the right, if they think there might be an endangered species on that land, to go on that land and look around. My land was right behind there. And heaven forbid, somebody went walking around and found one of these. My land, 640 acres that we put our cattle on, one of our biggest pieces of pasture, we couldn't use it. And then what happens? You can't sell it. So to me, I personally became very interested in land ownership, property rights, and conservation because that situation and also, heck, some of these conservation programs are amazing. They add extra income. But what's the what's the threats, the benefits, and the risks, right? As exactly. And, you know, with what you were saying that, you know, in Canada, they can go look for an endangered species on your property. One of the scariest things that the Biden administration has done with the Endangered Species Act is they can designate critical habitat on historic habitat, so where the species used to live, where the species um, lives now, or where the species could potentially live in the future, even if that land doesn't even have all of the ecological like necessities for the land they can still designate that as critical habitat saying, oh, well, maybe someday because of climate change, it's going to be the right environment for the species to thrive. So we are going to designate that as critical habitat, which basically means in the United States, there are no bounds for critical habitat designation, which is terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard some of this. And again, some of the reasons I wanted to have you on, because I don't think a lot of farmers are aware of this, right? It's quiet. It's hidden. It's not there. So I think it's important in the <laughs> a pun here, proper use of words, in the current climate where climate change, environmentalism, the green agenda is really, to me, it seems like it's really taking root and then protecting species and then farming. Where does that all intersect and how do we protect ourselves as farmers? And again, I'm not going to speak for you, but I'll, I know you and every farmer feels the same way. There's nobody that cares about land and animals more than we do. The people that sit in the cities or the suburbs and go, oh, nice little wolf, they released it. It's done. For us, we live it day in and day out, right? So it's not fair that anybody says otherwise, but 
I think these conversations are important. I think so too. And I think the best thing, and this is why I try so hard to do this in my career, is educating the public about agriculture and what we do and why we do it. Because, you know, it drives me crazy when people say that farmers and ranchers are destroying the land. Why, why would that make sense? If we destroy the land, we go out of business. You know, like even aside from the like morals and the love of the land and love of the animals, you know, if I abuse my cattle, I'm not going to get any money off of them. So aside from the fact that I love them, it doesn't even make sense. We wouldn't be in, in business for as long as my family's been in business if we were abusing our animals or overgrazing our land or something like that. Like it just logically doesn't make sense. And so I think that everybody should be getting out there. And I really appreciate, you know, podcasts and all kinds of social media accounts, because if we do not change the narrative of what agriculture is, this green agenda, which is based almost entirely on misconceptions of agriculture, is just going to get worse. We have to be educating the public and start closing the gap between the producers and the consumers. Oh, I love it. And I think those are probably just the most amazing words of wisdom to wrap up. I'll give you the floor if you want to add anything else to this conversation, final parting words. And then I'm going to ask you if there's people in the audience, how they can connect with you. I know you're on TikTok, LinkedIn, but share those details so people can follow you and your work. You're fantastic at what you do. Well, thank you so much. Um, I would say that the last sentence that I just gave sounds pretty like my general wrap it up is everyone please get involved so um i'm fine with that last part um, perfect that being was kind powerful. of the last word um for anybody who would like to get in contact with me or follow what i do uh, my website is wildwestadvocacy.com i'm on facebook instagram linkedin and tiktok all of those platforms are under my first name and my maiden name Sarah Fallon. Um, Sarah is S A R A H, and Fallon is F is in Frank, A L E N. Um, so, if anybody has any questions about anything that we've talked out talked about today, please feel free to get in contact with me from any of the places that I just listed. Love it, and we'll put those in the show notes as well. Impact. Go to farmmarketer.com, impact farming, find the show section, find the episode, and you can grab these details. Sarah, this was amazing. I knew it was going to be a fantastic episode, and it was even better than I thought. I enjoyed picking your brain on a few of these different things. I think it's important conversation. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, thank um, you so much for having me. I love having these kinds of conversations and, and talking about these issues. It's uh, you know, it's, it's one of my favorite things to do. So thank you so much for having me on your show and having really good questions. Oh, good. My pleasure. I was excited. You guys in the audience, if you enjoyed this as much as I did, like it, share it and get it out there because everybody needs to hear about these important facts and things that we're talking about. The conversation about conservation and property rights and land ownership, super important. If you guys enjoyed it, like it, share it, get it out there, like I said, and we'll see you next week. Bye, guys.